I think you can, but we can let you get on with your, your big toy, your proper toy. Yeah. <laughs> so this is, um, oh, sorry about that. This is the uh, standing MRI unit at Ballarat. And it looks like a shipping container. And that's because it is. And uh, the company Hallmark in England um, started putting these together several years ago as a, a modality of making it more available uh, to more practitioners because probably 80 to 90 percent of lameness has always been stated as being from the knee or hock down and this is what this machine can do it can go from the knee or the hock down to the ground and so um, we uh, bought this machine over from england just over five years ago now um, and it landed and it had all the computers inside it and it got put together and plugged into the electricity socket and it worked and it's been working ever since. So it's a, uh, it's, it's fantastic. Um, and the horses just walk up the ramp on the right hand side there. Um, the doors open up, it's air conditioned controlled. Uh, again, the equipment inside has to be kept at the right temperature and humidity. Um, and so the doors are open, the horse walks in and then the doors are shut. So it's remarkable um, how compliant the horses are in such a small area. And we've had 18 hand high warm blood stallions in there and under the right sedation techniques, uh, really good results with both front and hind legs. So just to explain this a little bit, um, again, to help understand how it happens, in this blue, um, shroud here this is a magnet and it creates a magnetic field between the two sides and that's why we can't have any metal inside the mri machine because if a horse had a shoe on the magnet it's a huge magnet it weighs about 400 kilos if the shoe stuck to it while it was on a horse's foot you can never turn a magnet off and so you cannot get that shoe off the magnet. So there's lots of incidences where people have forgotten and walked in there with the, um, anything that's metallic. Once you get inside this line here, the black and yellow line, if you've got a, a shoeing hammer in your hand, it will fly to that magnet and stick to it. Now you can slide a hammer off relatively easily because it's a small face, but it's, it's really quite dangerous. And we don't let people in there with pacemakers because uh, they don't go too well in the MRI machine and mobile phones are not allowed in there either. So <laughs> what happens is this is on a little um, uh, hoist device. We can move it up and down. So if we want to look at the knee, this will come up out of the floor and sit on either side of the knee. And again, the horse has to be really still um, because these images take about 45 seconds each to gather, uh, not quite as long as the bone scanner, but they do take time. So the feet are great because the foot's stuck on the ground, but if you give too much sedation and the horse starts rocking forwards and back, we don't get very good images at all. Um, so you have to be really patient in the bone scan, in the MRI room. Um, if everything goes well, and we want to look at a foot and a paston, we can be in and out in 45 minutes. If everything doesn't go well, we can be in and out in 24 hours. We've had cases where we've had a horse in there for a couple of hours, the horse gets sick of it, we take it out, we might bring it back later that afternoon, and we might even bring it back in the next morning to try and finish off a couple of views if we've got a really difficult horse. But that's rare for that to happen. But um, because you're in that small confined area, much smaller than the bone scan room, we have to be a little bit more conscious of when they get sick of what they're doing. Um, it's, it's pretty simple, big magnet hooked up to a big computer up, up, up the front of the room. And uh, we only have two people in the MRI room, one holding and administering the sedative as needed and the uh, veterinarian up the front who is running the computer. Now, the big difference between the standing MRI and the centigrade unit is you have to be really specific what you want to look at with the MRI. 
because we can only scan certain regions um, one at a time. The foot and paston, the knee, the fetlock, the hock, uh, the cannon bone. It's quite a small window of what you're looking for. And so we can't do upper body stuff. But the big bonus is that we get to see both bone and soft tissue. And that's certainly in the CT units, uh, in the standing CT units, you only get bone information. You don't get the soft tissue information that an MRI can give you. So that's where the, the big bonus is, especially in the feet um, and fetlocks of the horse. So um, now when we have a horse come to Ballarat for an MRI, um, we advise people that the horse needs to be here probably for most of the day to give us plenty of opportunity, but we'll often send them home the same day. With the bone scan, they have to stay for at least two nights. They come in the night before, get the bone scan, and then they have to stay until they're non-radioactive. So there's always a two-night stay for a bone scan, but an MRI on a good, well-behaved horse can be in and out in four to five hours. Now, once we've got the images of a bone scan, there's only a full body bone scan on a horse we would collect about 39 images. On an MRI, we would collect upwards of 300 images on any one area. And this is just a little example, a screenshot of, um, we take, sorry about that, phone ringing. Just remove that. <laughs> um, we take slices of the leg. The machine has the ability to take anything between four and eight millimeter slices um, to look at each part of the leg. And we can take them longitudinally through or sagittally like this. We can take them transverse across this way. And then in what we call a frontal plane to look at the tendons down the back. So you end up with this massive number of images um, because you have to go through them slice by slice to see if you can find where the injury is. And so that takes quite a long time. And it's very fine detail. And because we're a little busy at Ballarat, we send our scans off to um, both Europe and America and get radiology specialists to read our scans for us. Over the five year period, we've become, we think, 90% confident and capable of reading most of our scans, but some of the fine detail that the radiology specialists, that all they do all day long is look at MRIs, bone scans and CTs. They never touch a horse, they've done all that training, but now they just sit in front of a computer and they charge us a fee which is incorporated into the MRI fee, but it means that it probably saves me an hour and a half of my time doing it. They can do it a lot quicker and I would dare say a lot better. And uh, when you've been trained in MRI um, uh, teaching, uh, they say until you've done 500 MRI scans, you shouldn't be signing off on them because it's so easy to miss really small lesions. So that's why when we do an MRI, we get the horse in, send it home, and we tell the people, we'll get your results in 24 to 48 hours after we've sent them to the States, which is still a lot, lot quicker than the human industry. So I'll just go through quickly three uh, different cases and uh, to highlight the usefulness of the MRI. Uh, this is a horse that's lame. It blocks to a, a PD or a foot block and the radiographs are within normal limits. And so we did an MRI um, and in this particular uh, modality, this is called a stir sequence. Um, there's all different types of things you can do with this magnetic field and it changes from uh, a stir sequence to a, um, there's all different types of nominations, but in this one, the bone is meant to be black and fluid is white. So that's pretty basic. But this is the Paston bone. This is the navicular bone and that should be black and it's white. So that means there's a lot of fluid in that navicular bone. And even though it hasn't got radiographic evidence of bone being dissolved, that means it's painful. It's inflamed and there's increased fluid in the bone. 
So it's, and, and in this one also, the coffin joint is swollen. There's a lot more fluid here than we would normally expect to see in a coffin joint. So that's just off uh, one slice of an MRI. We can look at that. Um, this next case is a, a transverse um, uh, slice. And the deep flexor tendon that runs down the back of the paston and into the foot, it's, it's a bilobed structure. It's got these two black sort of elliptical areas. This one's a perfect ellipse. This one's got a little white spot here. Now that doesn't look like much, but that's a tear on the front surface of that tendon. And over here on the right, um, this one is a lot more obvious. This side of the tendon is perfect. The black area, a little bit of gray. You come over here and there's this big hole in the tendon. And that's getting down just above the level of the, of the navicular bone. And this is the only modality that you can diagnose that injury with. And technically, if you have a CT machine under a general anaesthetic, you can use what's called contrast agent and get a similar pattern, but you can't do it in the standing horse. So uh, this is really valuable uh, when we can identify that injury so people know why their horse is lame and not getting better. And then just finally, um, this is a foot penetration that came to us, uh, been lame for quite some time. And this slice through the bottom of the hoof, you can recognize the frog and there's fluid here in the sole where the nail went through the sole. But what we need to know is what structures has it gone into? Has it gone into just the sole, the soft tissues, the bone or the tendon? And so we can take this slice in a different angle and we can see the fluid pattern coming up here and the black stripe is the tendon running down onto the bone. And so this nail has hit the tendon just where it comes onto the bone. And when we look at it in a different pattern, here's the tendon across here and this is where the nails penetrated the tendon. So that tells us a lot how we're we going to advise the client on whether it's going to be a good outcome, whether it needs surgery. Um, so with that knowledge, we've got a much better idea of what type of surgery to advise or sometimes not advise because the horse might never become sound um, after that type of injury. So um, if we know exactly what we're looking at, we can help people um, sort out the management of how to get their horses back on track. And when Mike sends these horses in, um, you know, we can give accurate information that he can then go back and work with his clients. And probably the last thing I'd say about the MRI, because we can only do very specific areas, they need to be worked up really well. If they haven't had nerve blocks to isolate them to an exact knee, fetlock, paston or foot, we can't just do general screening with MRI because it takes too long and it's really expensive to look at a couple of thousand images to try and find out where the needle in the haystack is. So Mike is fantastic. He sends horses in uh, for MRI exams. He's done immaculate blocking history. So we know that we've only got to examine the foot and the paston and nothing else and we'll get the answer. So we get some horses sent for MRI that have not had high quality nerve blocks or joint blocks. And the people just say, oh yeah, we, we know it's from the fetlock down somewhere. Can we just get an MRI? And that's sort of dangerous because apart from costing a lot more to do more areas, you're not sure what you're seeing is where the problem is. So you really, it's the one time you really need high quality um, uh, digital local anesthesia to help you out to isolate it. So, um, so that's it. There we go. Thank Hopefully you very much, Ian. Um, have you any anyone any questions for Ian? Uh, with regards, I think he's covered it quite categorically. I think the MRI has been a game changer um, for me uh, now to be able to work up a lot of a lot of cases. Like I think it it just it just is a game a game changer. It's just allowed so much more diagnostics to be done and questions to be answered for people. So. Um, yeah, I just, if there's any questions, if there's not, we'll just roll on. There's a couple of, I think probably, and I think Ian, you've probably answered it already. Um, we had a question, 
um, from a gentleman. At what point post x-ray would you want to send a horse to an MRI and what will it show that an x-ray won't? So I think, um, I think Ian's answered a lot of it. I think the MRI is your, to your total imaging of the foot. I think sometimes um, when we block a foot, I know it's a horse vet, I think, oh no. There's literally a list of about 15 or 16 things that could be causing the problem. So I think if the x-ray findings don't match what the lameness is showing or how it's responding to nerve blocks, I think that's a good indicator to go to an MRI. Equally at times, and, and I understand we've had a few people ask about cost, and I think that's something we discuss offline. If you want to know about that you can give Ballarat a ring and have a chat to them about that directly about an MRI but everything needs to be worked up before then um, so it's no point as Ian just said you can't just turn up but I think an MRI is really useful when a you've got a penetrating wound like that we're worried about a tendon I think that's a great use of it two we've got a lameness that doesn't quite match what we're seeing so an example of a horse recent horses I've sent for MRIs are one X-rays were essentially pretty clean, to be honest. I think if I sent them to any vet as a pre-purchase, they would say there's no problems there, but the horse was obviously lame, locked to that region. We can't answer why. Or equally, there are times when we'll instigate treatment and it doesn't respond the way we thought it was. So I'm just going to show you that in the next... I'm going to go through a case that I, that I sent for MRI. Um, and so sometimes you'll read situations and, and it doesn't respond the way it is. We... With all the best intentions, none of us really like spending your money. We try not to. I know people think us horse vets want to spend your money. We try not to. We might need to get treatment before we go to do all the diagnostics and push on. So I hope that answers. And then I'll just... There's just one there, Mike. I might just answer that last one. Yeah. That what will an MRI show for a tendon that an ultrasound won't? Yeah. The biggest thing is that you can't get your ultrasound into every part of the foot to look at the entire tendon, especially around the back of the navicular bone and the navicular bursa and where it joins onto the, the pedal bone. So um, your ultrasound can get most um, lesions, but once you get down to the mid, past and lower, um, you need the MRI to get really accurate information. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. Exactly it. So, um, Hope that answers all your questions. And yeah, we're just gonna, I'm just gonna run through a couple of cases. We are sort of fast approaching nine o'clock and I don't wanna keep you guys too long and I do appreciate you all coming. Um, I'll show that at the end. So this is a case of a 10 year old dressage horse uh, presented as an on again, off again lameness. Um, a horse had been rested, would have a couple of weeks off, would come back and be signed. We might be stay signed for two months, three months, and then they, tip it out again if it went a bit uneven. The duration of this was about 12 months. Now the horse had been owned since it was a four year old, when it was vetted, there was no issues, fine. There was no x-rays done, but there was no issues, fine. And the horse was essentially fine. So in the last 12 months, we've had this lameness. Um, when I examined the horse, this is the lameness locator I put. Um, we had a bilateral forelimb lameness, and it was actually interesting. So this is the left circle. It was lame on the right four when it, um, when it was on the left, so on the outside of the circle, and on the right rein, it was lame on the left four. Um, and so we're seeing those changes. It was a very mild lameness. Uh, when I saw, you know, we've, vets are changing grading skills. We like to change grading skills all the time, but in the old school of one to 10, it was probably a one out of 10, a very mild asymmetrical lameness that was presented. So first thing was the nerve block of the left four foot. Um, the horse had pain up higher up the leg and I, I was probably a little bit surprised with the way the presentation, we normally think with a foot lameness, when you block, when the, when the leg foot's on the inside of the circle, you're putting more pressure on it and it would show up as lameness. This horse was doing the exact opposite and I had clinical findings of swelling, swollen fetlock joint and a, a pain on proximal suspensory palpation. I thought more likely we're gonna end up higher. With a mid pasture nerve block and the horse switched straight away to the other side which confused me a little bit, but that's horses do that. Um, so this, x-rays were just taken of the foot. Um, you'll see here, there's an extensive process fracture, okay? There was some effusion of the coffin joint in this region, but other than that, the rest of the x-rays were pretty unremarkable. There wasn't much change on the navicular bone, those tra traditional way, you know, lollipops or a number of changes we see on the navicular bone. Very little 
Food balance probably, you say, is a little bit flat-footed, but it's, it's pretty well shot, to be honest, you know, we've got that there. So we elected to initially, uh, initial response treatment was actually, we just placed a bar shoe and we packed the sole of the foot, aiming to sort of stabilize the coffin joint. And the really interesting thing with this horse was, so there's the chip there, just see it enlarged. It's quite rounded, so it has been there for some considerable time. And some of these, as I'll show you now, can be incidental findings. And um, so anyway, the horse actually, when I put the bar shoe and we put the packing in its sole, was barely able to walk. The horse actually deteriorated quite rapidly in front of our eyes. Um, within 24 hour period, it was really struggling. So obviously it was straight back. We removed the packing and the horse did improve. So pressure on the sole upwards on the back of the bottom of the foot made this horse considerably worse. And other than that, like the x-rays were really non-specific. Um, and so this was a horse we, we did elect to send the MRI up our up their practice. Um, the MRI findings. So I apologize, I'm no expert. As Ian said, reading MRIs is just such, such a specialized area. I don't even, I ask for copies of the MRI images from Ballarat and I usually have all, if you're, if you're a client and I've sent your horse, I've got them filed. And I look at them, trying to match them to the report to see if I can find the changes. And honestly, it can take me an hour to even with the report to try and match them to the images I've got. Um, and so this is the horse. There was no activity around this fragment. That was the one big thing I want to point out that um, someone asked before, when would you go to the MRI? This is the prime example of a horse that didn't respond to therapy as we expected. And we sent it. It actually had moderate to severe navicular di disease a really big deep digital flexor tendon injury and adhesions between the deep digital flexor tendon and the bursa and the collateral sesamoidian ligament. So there was actually a stun of pathology going on in the back of this foot that the horse, the horse is actually, we've changed the shoeing, we've wedged it up and it's confined. It's actually doing quite well. It's actually clinically quite well. It's doing quite well at the minute, but yeah, it's just an, it's an interesting case because there you go, horse, you've got a chip in a, coffin joint, a bit of effusion in the coffin joint, you think, well, that's probably it. And it turned out to be an absolute red herring. And it really was. And so that's where the MRI has been really a, a, an advantage to look at these feet where before, well, we've only had MRI five years in. What did we do before? We, we just, uh, sometimes we took those chips out thinking they were the cores, Mike. Yeah, <laughs> you know, with all the best intentions, that's, that's what we did. But now we can really drum down on these and, and, and sort of do that there. And I think probably that's one change I've seen probably in veterinary practice in my time is we're now with so much more diagnostics, we probably are going to surgery later and later. You know, instead of before, as I like said, we would have gone to surgery and taken that chip out and given it four months off and come back and it might have been all right for a couple of months and then gone sore again. You know, and where this horse has had a lot of pathology going on. So that's really the take home from there. Um, and then, yeah, so the take home is that with fate, sometimes we say is not all the picture. And um, as I've gone through that there, just one more. I know we've presented about high-end imaging and stuff like that. There's sometimes we don't go there. Um, this is a 14-year-old riding club horse that was presented. It was mildly lame in a front foot, and it had really poor, the farrier was struggling with its feet, and I was there basically to make an assessment and do some farrier x-rays to try and get some balance shots and see what was going on. So I take two views when we do this. There was pain on the hoof testers. It, had a, it, was, a typical, it was a thoroughbred off the track. But it was 14 now, and its heels sort of sat over the back of the shoe, really flat. You know, I don't need to put a picture of it to show you. You know what those type of feet are like. And we do a lateral, and we do a DP, a standing DP. So that's taken straight in front. And um, so this here image here, I'm just going to blow it up a bit. I probably wasn't expecting to see this, and you're probably saying, "What is he looking at?" Well, this is the pedal bone here. This is your pastern. And in the back here, we've got a navicular bone, and we've got a nice big fracture through there. So I'm not sure whether that's a bipartite navicular bone or it's an old fracture. You know, a bipartite is they're born that way, and it, it's, it's been that way all its life. The horse hasn't any recent history. It's been owned by the people for 
nine years and it's had no sudden onset of severe lameness suggestive of fracture and so i think it's most likely it's been there a long time maybe it happened in racing i doubt it it's usually they're pretty sore when I've, the couple i've seen um but yeah we took some more you see here the fracture line some views um i was a bit of a naughty boy i didn't take the shoes off this horse um because he really can't cope without shoes and the fire was a couple of days away so um, yeah, and the horse actually is now, um, it's actually signed, completely signed. It has a bar shoe on and his leather pads. And um, just the take home is sometimes we don't end up with MRI. I'm sure I would probably love to see an MRI of that horse's foot to see what the pathology is in the back of the back of the foot. But I think some horses, even with changes in the back of those feet, can actually get back and do the job that they're required to do. So that's just it um i suppose the take home i want to take now I, first of all i want to thank ian he's put a lot of effort into doing this for me he's a very busy gentleman i'm sure he's probably up last night dealing with a colic or something like that there great surgeon if i ever refer you up there or you're ever if you're from up that way you know ian's ian's the man to go to he's great and he's been fabulous to me um over the years i've known him now i think he's coming up 16 years um, it's been a long time, but um, we're both getting grayer um, on the throat. But that's why we'll refer you guys. You know, I'll refer people to Ballarat. I really like their style. We do good. They do a good job, and they've got all the tools and the, the toys to play with. So, if there's any questions, far away. I think we've got one more. Yeah, I think that's all good. And um, so. Just the last thing, Lara Tweedy Equestrian is obviously sponsoring this event. And if you do log onto your website and use the code 3XWB25, there is 25% discount for 24 hour period. So thank you very much, everyone. I really do appreciate you coming. The next webinar is the horse's foot. I'm going to take on this big topic in three weeks' time. I might end up having to split it up into two webinars. I think it's a bit big but we'll go through the anatomy and all the structures and some of the common conditions. So um, thank you very much for joining us. And if there's no questions, we will finish up for the evening. Thank you very much.